This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Earth Day. Do you wish Earth had a day? Try Earth Day today! Welcome to episode 81 of The Sweaty Penguin, Antarctica's hottest podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Brown, and happy Earth Day! How about that? Our first episode actually on Earth Day. And we saved an especially important topic for this occasion. Today, we are talking about migration, one of four things humans and birds have in common. The other three things are that we're both warm-blooded, we both care for our young, and everyone gets annoyed every time we open our mouths. Actually, I guess that's not all humans and birds, more just Carrot Top and Zazu. Specifically, we'll be talking about climate migration, which is a term that describes the phenomenon of people across the globe being displaced from their homes due to the impacts of climate change. People have always migrated due to the environment, just ask your aunt in Florida after her water aerobics class. But as climate change has progressed, and we've seen worse floods, hurricanes, wildfires, crop failures, etc., more and more people are being forced to make this decision rather than choosing it for themselves. In fact, according to a World Bank report from last year, more than 200 million people are likely to migrate over the next three decades because of extreme weather events or the slow degradation of their environments. So today, we're going to break down the ways climate change is forcing people to move, how this issue affects us negatively and positively, and how policy could better prepare for this. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. If you want to take two minutes to help out the Sweaty Penguin, you can either leave us a five-star rating and review, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. Doing either earns you a special shout-out at the end of the show. Joining the Patreon gets you merch, bonus content, and a whole lot more. But first, a little international relations class. <laughs> In today's class, we are covering the UNHCR, or the Union for No Haggle Car Rentals. Wait, sorry, I read that wrong. It's actually the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. But now that I think about it, we should have no haggle car rentals, where they don't gaslight you into buying eight types of insurance. Anyway, the actual UNHCR is really important. Its primary purpose is to safeguard the rights and well-being of people who have been forced to flee. Those who are migrating fall into a few different categories that the UNHCR has established, and today we will focus on asylum seekers, internally displaced people, and refugees. These distinctions will be on the pop quiz at the end. Asylum seekers are individuals who, after already crossing the border of another country, are seeking international protection and often trying to gain the label of asylee. Refugees, on the other hand, are individuals who have been given the status of refugee by the UNHRC and have either been resettled in another country or are waiting to be resettled. The difference is largely procedural. Asylum is more country by country, whereas refugee comes from the UN, and there are minor differences in the rights and resources for each group. Finally, we have internally displaced people, or IDPs, who are people fleeing to other parts of their own countries. Unlike asylum seekers and refugees, IDPs do not cross any international borders. Obviously, it's easy to make a moral argument for why resources for asylees or refugees or any migrant are important. That's about as easy as the moral argument for why you don't double park, or why you don't turn off the radio when all summer long comes on. It's just part of being in a functioning society. 
There's a lot of really awful humanitarian crises around the world, and I'm not going to attempt to list them all, but it's certainly part of being human to help out innocent people who are in danger. What exactly that looks like, we can obviously debate, but that much I think we can agree on. And I shouldn't have to elaborate beyond that, but I will, because that alone doesn't capture the whole picture. Yes, providing resources helps the migrant, but it also helps the country they migrate to, as Columbia University's Dr. Niraj Kaushal explains. So in the last three decades, half of the increase in labor force in the United States has been because of immigrants and their children. The second statistic says in the next three decades, almost all of the increase in labor force would be because of immigration. Dr. Kaushal has written extensively on the topic of migration, and while these insights from her research could be framed as a negative, there are also many positives to it. In the United States and many other countries, birth rates are on the decline. Ironically, birth rates began declining in the U.S. in 2007, which is just one year after Crocs received their patent in 2006. I mean, talk about a mood killer. But because birth rates are declining, that means the number of people entering the workforce is going to start to be lower than the number of people retiring. And without more births, which we kind of lock in 20 years in advance there has to be more immigration to fill the vacancies. Migrants can also bring new skills, perspectives, and experiences to their positions. Obviously, this isn't a silver lining for any situation that leads to forced migration. There's no pros and cons list for a humanitarian crisis. But this is why, given Dr. Kaushal's projections, investing in aid for migrants actually helps the U.S. economy in the long run, as well as the people and their families. Alright, so we have the categories, asylees, refugees, and internally displaced people. Now, enter climate change. Because, sure, why not? That won't make things worse. Climate migration can be broken down into two main categories, based on what we call push factors. Push factors are what ultimately lead people to make the decision to leave their homes. The first push factor is through more slow-onset issues that gradually make people's land harder and harder to live on until they eventually make the decision to move. This typically takes place when climate change alters weather patterns, making traditionally agricultural land significantly drier, wetter, or just more unpredictable. You could say the same for how lyrics in Cardi B songs are changing. Anyone who uses this land as their source of livelihood, such as farmers, may be forced to leave because they can no longer make a living in that area. Often, these migrants move to big cities with more job opportunities, which for our categories would make them internally displaced people. This comes with its own set of challenges, as we discussed in our megacities episode. Cities have high and fast-growing populations already, many have issues with slums, and most are on coasts and face climate threats of their own. This slower push factor is very prevalent today, and it is only projected to get worse, with the International Organization for Migration stating that the proportion of land in constant drought is expected to increase from 2% now to 10% by 2050. So Cardi B has her work cut out. The second push factor is a more quick onset, natural disasters. These come in the form of many topics we've covered, such as severe storms or sea level rise that lead to flooding, wildfires, hurricanes, and much more. Natural disasters lead to more of a mass exodus from an area, rather than the more gradual one we've seen with the slow onset factors. Unfortunately, most of these are because things got too wet, so I don't know if Cardi B can help with that. What does all this mean for the international community? Well, we may think of violence or persecution as being the main causes of displacement in the world, but according to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, the number of displacements caused by natural disasters in 2019 was three times the number of displacements caused by conflict and violence. As climate change worsens, 
this likely will too. Additionally, this is an issue that no country will be able to escape, regardless of development status. That said, developing countries with less wealth are taking the brunt of the impact right now, and their capacity for providing aid and absorbing new immigrants is pretty dismal. And while I'm not here to lecture you on ethics, only to lecture you on the Steelers and the danger of peanuts, much of climate change can be attributed to the emissions of developed countries. That's why developing countries are rightly frustrated that they're disproportionately facing the consequences, and migration is a prime example of that. It has also become clear that this isn't a future issue. Take Lohachara Island. This island off the coast of India is often brought up as one of the first to become submerged due to rising sea levels, and that happened in December of 2006. So while everyone was watching The Departed and practicing accents from Southie, 10,000 people lost their homes on this island. 2006 was the year. And according to Dr. Pranabish Sanyal of India's National Coastal Zone Management Authority, more islands face a similar threat. Some islands are totally submerged, uh, like uh, Lohachara and Supurivanga, and uh, one island, very big island, which is called Ghoramara Island, uh, that is nearly 40% reduced uh, as on today. So this type of islands where human habitation was there, uh, the people are becoming uh, environmental refugees because they have to evacuate their home. Dr. Sanyal points out that the larger Goramara Island is facing a similar fate, and that's really concerning. Already, we've seen Goramara Island's population shrink from 40,000 to around three or 4,000. Beyond just the horror of your home disappearing into the ocean, people then have to worry about where they go, if they'll be accepted in, where they'll live, can they get a job, can they take care of their family, all because of something that was so clearly not their fault. And sadly, the situation Dr. Sanyal describes in India is far from the only one. In the last few decades, people have actually been moving toward coasts. According to the World Economic Forum, the number of people living in areas at high risk from rising sea levels increased from 160 million to 260 million in the past 30 years. Apparently, the world population has taken the same position on sea level rise as me when I had a big paper due in college. We'll worry about it later, now it's sandcastle time. But now, that's catching up to us. The Internal Displacement Monitoring Center found that in 2019 alone, nearly 1,900 disasters triggered 24.9 million new displacements across 140 countries and territories. 24.9 million displacements. That's over 33 times the number of people at Coachella this year. I know the math is skewed because Kanye didn't go, but still... To think this local issue Dr. Sanyal illustrated is happening worldwide at this scale is absolutely horrifying. What about after people have moved? There are many issues here too, from overcrowding in receiving locations, to legality and aid, to gender and health disparities within displaced communities. It's a potpourri of problems, and sadly it does not smell like grandma's house. Often, climate migrants will remain in the same country, but move to a city, or will only go to neighboring countries, neither of which are well prepared for this. We discussed some of the issues with cities already, and for neighboring countries, these are likely developing countries too, and outside of international organizations that come in, they may not be equipped to provide adequate support. And if these people are classified as internally displaced, as they would be if they stayed in their home country, international organizations can't help much either. And that process of aid is an issue in itself. You might have heard people who are forced to move due to climate be called climate refugees. But technically, under the UNHCR's definition of a refugee, climate migrants don't count. 
which is honestly really frustrating. It's like when you play basketball with a five-year-old and they make up a rule that your point didn't count because the ball bounced off the backboard first. Billy, I don't know who told you that, but a basket's a basket. You can't go inventing rules. But it's true. Climate migrants have not been given refugee classification by the UNHCR. And as such, they don't receive the aid allotted to refugees. That's a big deal. Because the majority of aid goes to those with refugee designation. This leaves fewer options for climate migrants and makes it harder for them to be legally resettled in other countries. I guess the good news is at least the UNHCR is aware of this issue. Listen to their special advisor on climate action, Andrew Harper. While climate refugees does not exist in, under international law, it does capture the sense of urgency and vulnerability of populations and the need to act on those people, uh, on behalf of those people who have been forced to flee. If we know uh, the impact of climate change is real, and if we know that there's going to be tens of millions of people made more vulnerable, then we need to be stepping up our game. So that's something. They acknowledge they need to step up their game. Just the fact that they have a special advisor on climate action is something. But in terms of concrete steps, the UN has only urged countries to consider climate migration when making policy, but has not changed any formal policy on the international level to further assist those displaced due to climate change. They are not covered under the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees, which protects those fleeing persecution, and they do not fall under the non refoulement principle, which says that those who cross borders fleeing persecution should not be sent back against their will. I know, that's what you were wondering too. You know, until today, I thought refoulement was when a hockey player comes out of the penalty box and immediately whacks someone with their stick, so we're all learning. But this isn't just legal mumbo-jumbo. In 2015, a citizen of the Pacific Island nation of Kiribati tried to apply for asylum in New Zealand using the term climate refugee, but was rejected and sent back to Kiribati. When he filed a complaint with the UN in 2016, the UN upheld New Zealand's decision. They did state that courts should start considering how climate change can violate people's right to life, so it wasn't necessarily open and shut, but this case certainly set a concerning precedent. So while I hope Andrew Harper's sentiment that the UNHCR needs to step up their game is shared around the agency, we certainly haven't seen that come to fruition. And on top of all that, once migrants have moved and end up on the outskirts of a city or within some sort of informal settlement, they continue to face problems with both physical and mental health. If a border has been crossed, it is hard for the displaced person to receive medical attention due to the legality behind their being in that country. Migrants also suffer higher levels of PTSD, anxiety, and depression. Women face some disproportionate impacts, as girls are more likely to be pulled out of school to help in disasters, especially with things like collecting water, which is a much more grueling journey during droughts. And additionally, according to the Global Humanitarian Overview Report from the UN in 2019, 60% of preventable maternal deaths take place in contexts of conflict, displacement, or natural disasters. Women are also more prone to gender-based violence during and after crises, according to UNICEF. So where do we go from here? It's a tricky question, right? Because this isn't an issue that can be eradicated. It's not like the storage almost full pop-up that comes up on your phone every hour of every day, where to fix it, all you have to do is smash your phone with a sledgehammer and throw it into a lake. I guess that doesn't work on a Nokia phone, though. That would probably shatter your sledgehammer. So there isn't a solution that just whacks climate migration with a sledgehammer and makes it go away. That said, there are ways to make communities more resilient, and there are ways to give migrants more support. First off, there is certainly room to improve our mindset around climate migration. Again, climate migrants often don't want to leave their homes, they are forced to. And while this issue does disproportionately affect developing countries, even within developed countries like the United States, climate migration is happening. 
In fact, the United States was fifth on the list of countries with the highest levels of displacement triggered by natural disasters in 2020, according to the 2020 Global Report on Internal Displacement. Think of the campfire in 2018, which wiped the town of Paradise, California off the map. Think of Hurricane Katrina in 2006, forcing 1.5 million people from their homes, 600,000 of whom never went back to this day. This is climate migration. These are internally displaced people, and it's right in our backyard. More of a public understanding that this issue does affect all of us in the U.S. and around the world could certainly be a step in the right direction. We could also improve our mindset on how to plan for these situations. As people move away from an area due to these environmental changes, think about what happens. Property values go down, tax revenue dries up, insurance rates skyrocket, the Geico Gecko stops making scrumptious jam and starts sending your calls to voicemail. Not good. You reach a point where the area is left with just the people who didn't have the means to move. And when that next disaster hits, it's that much harder to quote-unquote rebuild. That's why, according to insurance executive Samantha Medlock, it may be worth thinking about getting out in front of the problem rather than addressing it as it comes. Individuals and communities that are relying entirely on public disaster aid are going to suffer the greatest in the wake of a disaster. Yeah. And is that really the best use of federal taxpayer investment? Wouldn't it make more sense to focus on getting out ahead of the disaster? That's not what federal disaster aid was designed to do, and that's not how it's, uh, how it's playing out for communities in the wake of these big storms. And that's pretty scary. That's scarier than that one jump scare in us. But Samantha's point, as hard as it is to think about, may not be the worst idea. I know no one wants to leave their hometown or admit they're in a particularly vulnerable area. But if we take out the emotions for a moment and look purely from a logical perspective, it may save taxpayer money and be more equitable to coordinate migrations out of these areas ahead of time, put in resources, help everybody out, rather than having to do it in an emergency. People don't have to risk their safety, they don't have to lose personal belongings. There are a lot of upsides to this idea. But it is a tall task, because I don't think anyone wants to be forced to move. And even for those who are willing to move, we have to consider where they go, where they'll work, where they'll live. You might remember in our gentrification episode that climate migration can drive gentrification in cities if left to its own devices. So certainly this discussion Samantha encourages us to have is really challenging, but it's a good talk to have. Maybe we can get our logic and emotions on the same page, and not in the cable sportscaster way where their logic and emotions are both completely unjustified. Seriously, how many mock drafts are you going to make? In addition to changing the way that migration is framed, there are also concrete actions that the UN can take to assist with climate migration. One of these ways is through discussing climate migration as part of the Sustainable Development Goals. We talked about these a week and a half ago. These are 17 goals for 2030, ranging from equality to economic development to environmental conservation, all stuff to make the world a better place. According to Goal 10.7, countries should be helping to facilitate orderly, safe, and responsible migration and mobility of people, including through implementation of planned and well-managed migration policies. It sounds like climate change will squeeze its way in there, right? Like that friend of a friend who shows up to your Halloween party. You didn't invite him, but like, now that he's here, we'll make the best of it. Kind of weird he dressed up like Knuckles from Sonic, though. But by viewing it as part of the development goals, countries may be more likely to take climate migration seriously. The UNHCR could also expand their definition of refugees to include climate refugees. 
According to Kaylee Ober of Refugees International, the 1951 Refugee Convention through the UNHCR is a really strong legal mechanism for granting rights to migrants. So the 1951 Refugee Convention is globally recognized. It's a very strong international accord comparatively to others, and most nation states follow it. Honestly, it, it's one of the strongest protection mechanisms we have when it comes to those who are um, crossing over borders. It affords a person moving and applying for asylum a much broader scope of rights than under any other mechanism that might exist. Incentivizing countries is one thing. But to put the full force of the UN behind this climate migration issue could turn out to be a more reliable strategy. As we've discussed many times, getting a country to do anything is impossible, like trying to teach a shark to roller skate. So while changing this classification would require broad support, it could certainly be a step in the right direction. Obviously, given a lot of the international environmental treaties we discuss, you may think of international laws as very weak compared to laws within countries. That's why I found this soundbite from Kaylee really interesting. Kaylee says that the 1951 Refugee Convention is actually bucking the trend. It is a strong piece of international policy. It grants a lot of rights, and most countries follow it. So if climate migrants could be a part of it, they'd certainly have access to a lot more support than they currently do. That would be pretty refreshing to have some international cooperation on a climate thing. And of course, the biggest fix of them all is to mitigate climate change. We talk all the time about ways to do that, and as the new IPCC report reminded us, many climate migration solutions also improve the economy and a lot of other global issues too. Check out our episode on that, it was actually pretty remarkable. Between mitigating climate change, better preparing for climate migration through laws and strategies, and thinking about migration differently, we can't eradicate the problem, it's already here. But we can make it a lot more manageable. We can make sure it affects as few people as possible, and we can make sure whoever is affected gets the support they need. I know this is a really overwhelming topic, and maybe we shouldn't have dumped it on you on Earth Day. Maybe we should have done a day of panda facts. I mean, did you know newborn pandas are smaller than a mouse and weigh about four ounces? Now there's an episode. But in all seriousness, I thought it was worth mentioning this human dimension of climate change. There isn't some magic cutoff where we're screwed and we stop doing anything. Human issues like this get worse every tenth of a degree we warm, and the faster we act, the more people we protect. This is why climate change matters. This is why, despite all the doom and gloom out there, we can't give up. And if we do get this under control, we'll protect a lot of innocent people, help our economy, and make sure the only birds and humans that have stuff in common are Carrot Top and Zazu. Have you always wanted to one-up Jupiter? If so, Earth Day is for you. Jupiter may have cool rings and gases and moons and stuff, but does it have a day? I didn't think so. Oh, wait, Jupiter Day is every Thursday? That's why it's called Hueves? And Earth Day is just once a year? <sighs> okay, never mind. Earth Day. Hey, at least our planet's covered in plastic and stuff. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to The Sweaty Penguin. With me today is Dr. Gregory White, the Mary Huggins Gamble Professor of Government at Smith College. Dr. White, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to this. Thank you, Ethan. First off, tell us a little bit about your research and how you became interested in climate migration. My initial work in political science you know, coming out of African studies was focusing on North African politics, broadly speaking, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria principally, but also Libya and Mauritania and the Sahelian countries to the south of the North African countries. But then 
starting in the late 90s and early zeros, I started to turn more directly toward migration politics because it became much more salient and much more important in North African politics. I started to write more about it and study it more directly. And then starting in the zeros in the middle part of the first decade, 2005, 2006, 2007, people began to speak more directly about climate migration and environmental migration from North Africa, that people were impelled to cross, to try to get to Spain, to try to get to Italy, France perhaps as well, but you know, most, most significantly at the crossing points at Spain and Italy, because they were pushed by environmental change and climate change. And so that became much more of a focus. And that's how I've turned more recently in the last decade, you know, basically the last 10 years or so toward climate migration, environmental migration, climate refugees, environmental refugees, that whole sort of really challenging set of uh, questions. And one of the questions you ask uh, one of your recent papers is titled Climate Refugees, a Useful Concept? Question mark. And the title really jumps out at me because I at least hadn't seen that question asked before. So I wanted to ask what led you to consider that question and what did you learn in that process? Yeah, I think it's become often invoked as a category, sort of an assumption that climate change is happening and it's real and it's profound and it's affecting people's lives already and will continue to do so. And then there's sort of an additional second assumption. I mean, the first assumption is kind of obvious and easy and we all make it. But the second then assumption is that people will be forced to move because of this climate change and that they will move great distances and they will cause migration flows slash refugee flows. And there's a really you know, complicated and intense debate about the categories of migrant and refugee, as you likely know. But the idea then is that because of climate change, people will be compelled to move, forced to move great distances. And so therefore, they are climate refugees. They will be seeking refuge from climate change. So the logic and the assumptions of it are all really kind of solid and reasonable. And I, I think it's sort of understandable that people move in that direction. And we can talk about some of the different kinds of arguments that people make, but that's the typical logic. And one of the ways I've been trying to argue in recent years is that it doesn't necessarily work for all kinds of complicated reasons. One is empirical. The fact is that climate change often doesn't prompt people to move great distances. They can't move great distances if they're weakened by the effects of climate change. You need resources to move great distances. You need money and networks and contacts and strength and uh, you know, resources. And it's really hard to do so. So what we see with climate change and, and, and the impacts on human migration is that it actually can impede people's movements. People tend to suffer in place. Or if they move, they move to nearby cities or they move within a country or they maybe move within a region. But this idea that is really commonplace is that people are going to move great distances and move north from the global south to the global north. I think that's what we're seeing as a real empirically questionable proposition. I read that you were kind of saying how these people don't have malicious intent, even if they were entering a new country. It's not like this is quite the national security risk, we might see it argued that it is. And I thought that was a really interesting argument and an interesting point. And I was curious what you think about that, because obviously that could kind of be turned into a national security type conversation, even though um, the more malicious intent might not be as valid. Just sort of think of two broad kinds of arguments that people make about, quote unquote, climate refugees. One argument comes from what I like to call the green left. These are people who are on the political left, generally speaking, who understand that climate change is real. It's going to cause people to move. And I think people on the green left use or think to use climate refugees as a way of getting people to be concerned about climate change. You know, you may not be concerned about climate change, their argument might go, but you should be because it's going to force people to move and that's going to cause issues. You know, it's going to cause disruption. It's going to be cause border issues. It's going to cause migration dynamics. And that's why you should be concerned about climate change. And I think on the other side of the coin, and there's a lot of in-betweens, but on the other side of the coin is a kind of security-minded 
kind of security right, right of center argument. And again, it's complicated and all kinds of different permutations of this, but this is basically the view that people are going to be moving and it's going to cause security concerns, instabilities, conflict, shortages, and a need, therefore, for things like border security, enhanced border security. And you see this kind of argument. And often I think people on the security right, they understand climate change is real. They also accept the mainstream science and they are security minded, they're defense establishment or intelligence establishment kind of agencies or the Pentagon or defense ministries. This is where they're coming from. And it's, you know, their concern is that climate migration and climate refugees are going to cause a security dilemma. So that's, you know, I think it's maybe helpful to sort of unpack those kinds of two broad kinds of arguments. And what's interesting too about it, Ethan, is that they often use each other. I think it's interesting because I certainly always try to make arguments in the context of other issues that people might care about if they're not kind of the outdoorsy type that I wasn't. But this was really interesting because you were kind of saying, hold on, we can't go too far with this. And I certainly completely agree with that. And it's, it makes it even more of a challenge to talk about this issue, but certainly worthwhile to be sure we're talking about it correctly. I think so. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. And I think one thing I would want to be clear about too, is that there's no doubt climate change, again, will affect people and is affecting people profoundly. And there are instances where climate change is impelling people to move. I mean, one important category of countries at the United Nations are small island developing states. And so SIDS countries, they're dealing with significant inundation, you know, erosion, groundwater, sort of salinization of water. It's a real issue. And so I wouldn't minimize for a second that people in low-lying areas, people in islands have been and will be sharply affected. Same with drought, same with slow onset events that's affecting people's lives and forces them to move. But what I and several other people were trying to point out is that to call that kind of migration, climate migration or climate refugees would be deeply simplistic. And the way I often put it is you're using the climate adjective to modify the refugee noun. And it just makes the reasons why people move much more simplistic than they really are. And I think ultimately can do significant ideological problems. You made a great point when you said how climate migration really isn't like traveling across continents. And I'm curious, with that in mind, what role do you think the United States plays in this conversation? Because obviously we are in the global north. We're a little further from a lot of the parts of the world that are going to be hit the hardest by climate change. Obviously, we have some internal displacement here, but what types of issues do you see the United States kind of being a part of in this global conversation? As a North Africanist, I'd focus on West Africa and the movements to try to get across the Mediterranean or not, and up to Europe, to the North, to Europe. The United States is really analogous and in comparative terms is in a similar position with respect to Central America and South America, uh, people trying to get across the Central America isthmus through Mexico to the United States. Absolutely. That's a longstanding issue for U.S. presidential administrations. I mean, it's been decades and centuries of interchange with Central America and South America. So the reasons why people move having to do with economies and conflict and policies by governments is much more complicated than, well, climate change is happening and it's forcing people to move. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about those numbers we see because- I always try to get statistics from good places. And I think that this uh, climate refugee issue, if uh, you want to call it that, is there's a lot of different numbers out there. I see some even saying in the present, we have millions of climate refugees. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, where are these numbers? Like, how are we getting these numbers? And are they... Like, what exactly are they referring to? And how do we conceptualize it if it really is of this kind of magnitude of the numbers that we're seeing? My own take is that it's really, really, really hard to find precise numbers. And that, you know, uh, demographers and migration studies people who work on these issues are confounded. And I think sometimes when we see these significantly huge estimates, 
of again, 200 million or 500 million or a billion people. I think what you're getting into there, and there's some wonderful scholarship by people like Peter Andreas and Kelly Greenhill on this in terms of migration flows and trafficking and refugee flows. And it's a social science dynamic where you don't want to underestimate. You might say conservative estimate are, and then you might say estimates range as high as, but then the next person coming to that piece of writing or that piece of research then says, oh, I have seen an estimate like this. And that begins to become the conservative estimate. And so there's a ratcheting up because no one wants to underestimate, right? So there's that kind of impulse to constantly uh, upwardly estimate. I'm not minimizing for a moment the impact of climate change, but it's not impelling these kinds of massive flows and movements that the estimates tend to sometimes uh, often move toward. It's my last question for you. In what ways do you see countries being able to work together on climate migration? And where do you see some roadblocks? And perhaps what would your advice be to policymakers on the world stage? Two points I want to make. And you know, one thing we haven't gotten into is you know, one of the things I've been trying to work on is the ideological dimensions of this. And I think one of the things that needs to be put on the table is ways that this is often manifested as racialized anxieties about the global South. And it's a difficult topic. And it's, you know, it's complicated. But if you're going to go back to that conversation about the green left and its categorizations of climate refugees, if you're going to say that this is the human face of climate change, often these appeals show peoples in afflicted parts of the globe, in the global south. And sort of an obvious point is that you're showing people of color. And I think similarly for the security-minded right, when these depictions come forward, and I'm thinking of documentary films and also in social science writing, same sort of thing. There's, a, there's an emphasis on these are regions of the world that are going to move north. They're going to move to the global north. Those kinds of examples, it's deeply racialized. But I even think if you move away from that kind of severe ethno-nationalism and you know, white supremacist kind of arguments, climate refugees are often where green discourses can turn to a kind of emphasis on whiteness. And I think that's something that we have to be really mindful of as we, uh, as we get into this kind of debate. So that's a long way of answering your question, like what are things that can be done? I think my argument fundamentally is we need to disentangle climate change from refugee and migration politics. So it's a climate change, I think, first and foremost, has to be addressed. And then in terms of refugee politics and migration politics, really push back against this easy and, um, as you can see, I think, simplistic invocation of, of climate migration and climate refugees as a useful category, as a useful uh, way of understanding what's on the horizon or what's coming, quote unquote, our way. I just think that's not a very um, useful way of framing the, uh, the issue. Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you're very welcome. It's been, a, it's been a true pleasure. This wraps up episode 81 of The Sweaty Penguin. Take two minutes, help out the show, and get a shout-out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. You get merch, bonus content, and more. Clips today came from CNBC, AP Archive, UNHCR, NBCLX, and IOHR-TV. Special thanks to our Emperor Penguin patrons, Lawrence Harris and Brownie Central. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and guests. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions or views of Peril and Promise or the WNET Group. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week.